Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Campbell. I'm a data analyst at a crowdsourced hedge fund in Boston called Quantopian. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how I solved the problem that I was uh, presented with as a data analyst using this really cool tool called IPython Widgets. And when I say that Quantopian is a crowdsourced hedge fund, I mean that we're a free platform for building, trade, building, deploying, researching, and discussing algorithmic trading strategies. And so anyone can come to our site and for free, code up an algorithm in Python, backtest it on 13 years of minute level historical pricing data, deploy it on the market, and then they can enter our contest. Um, but the really cool part, and the part that we're working really hard to expand right now, is this hedge fund part of the business, where we're looking through this database of trades and historical performance on these algorithms and trying to find the best algorithm writers. And so we can't look at the algorithm code, so we're left looking at, like I said, this exhaust data just to see who are the people we want to invite to be part of our fund. Go to those individuals, invite them to be a part of our fund, and say, hey, we love what you're doing. We'd love to give you a cut of the profits you generate as a part of, uh, as a part of our um, company. And so as a data science team, we're faced with this kind of 700,000 to 10 problem um, where we've got all these algorithms in our point in time database and we need to filter down and find which are the absolute best that we want to invest in. And what that means is that um, we can automate this, largely automate this process. 99% of um, what comes to the platform, we can filter out based on just some like pretty tight filters on backtest performance. What's left over? We let sit for six months, where it accumulates six months, or maybe sometimes longer, depending on the characteristics of the algorithm, of out of sample data. Data to which the algorithm writer could not have possibly overfit their strategy because it had not occurred yet. And then after that out of, out of, out of sample data accumulates, we put, the, we put the algo through another set of performance filters, and then we're left with a smaller collection that we have to parse through manually. And this kind of brings us to like a theme in data science that not everything can be automated. Sometimes there's manual steps. You know, data has to be digested in a graphical form in a way that a human can look and say, oh, it's trading these names, and like this you know, period is worrisome that we haven't yet been able to codify. I think we would love to be able to make this an automatic crank that we just turn, but we're not quite there yet. And so we needed something to facilitate this manual step, this last step of saying, what, what do we want to actually include in our fund? And so to, for the data digestion part of this problem, we built this awesome, um, this awesome uh, Python module called PyFolio, which if you were around for Jess's talk earlier, she gave an awesome crash course in what PyFolio has to offer. For those of you who weren't, it's um, you pass in a back test. Um, it, it's actually platform agnostic in that it's an open source project. You can pass in any form of returns or positions data uh, or the, the form that it's expecting, and it'll generate all these beautiful plots that, um, that tell you about the performance of the algorithm over time, what its drawdowns were, um, and then a bunch of really cool stuff on Bayes Bayesian analysis comparing the in and out of sample periods. So we built this awesome tool, but we still were left with this bookkeeping problem. We needed to remember which algorithms do we write, when were they written? How do we keep track of them? Who are these authors? And this, this, uh, this bookkeeping problem, we, we, we like many fledgling projects, um, we started with a Google Doc. And you're all familiar with this. Um, it was great at first. We're plugging and playing. We're, we're grading strategies. Everything looks good. And then we get to about 45 algos and things start to go downhill really fast. It's very hard to keep track of, you know, 20 character long random uh, like Mongo IDs um, in, a, in a way that you're not gonna absolutely lose your mind. And so there was a lot of cutting and pasting involved here, a lot of messy unstructured data, and so we knew we needed something a little bit more productized. Luckily, we ha already had this really cool JupyterHub data science environment um, that we were using to do all of our analysis. G uh, Jupyter Hub is a multi-user server system for the Jupyter, aka IPython notebook platform. Um, it's awesome because we leverage the computing power of AWS. Like, we're running on some huge beefy instance in the cloud. We don't have to worry about, oh, is my laptop fast enough to crunch this 20 gigs of data? Um, and we can easily distribute what we create with one another. As a team, you know, everything flows um, 
from user to user really easily. If you're interested, uh, we do. My colleague Thomas Wiki has written an awesome Docker file that allows you to quickly spin up um, a Jupyter Hub uh, environment complete with the whole PyData stack. And so we started uh, to use this this Jupyter Hub environment as our replacement Google Doc. This is gonna be the platform off of which we're gonna build our bookkeeping system. And so I started by writing some simple functions. I set up a Postgres database um, and started writing functions in SQL Alchemy that would simply just take algorithm IDs, grades, comments, put them in the database, query them out of the database, super simple. I threw all these, these functions in a notebook, um, handed it off to my team, and the results were so-so. Um, as we found out, there's a lot that can go wrong when you just give someone an undocumented function in a big messy notebook. Uh, our, my users weren't necessarily entering their names in a uniform format. They weren't necessarily entering uh, a uniform set of grades, which was really a big problem when at the end of the day we want to say, all right, which of the algorithms fall in these four buckets? And we've got people using different grading systems. Some are using A, B, C, others A, A minus, B plus. And so I needed something that would force a convention upon our data science team and allow, uh, allow us to like very strictly uh, enforce some rules when it came to grading. And we also needed this, this new grading bookkeeping platform to be uh, something that we could iterate on really fast. To my knowledge, no one has really ever crowdsourced a hedge fund. If you go on like Instructables and look up how to crowdsource a hedge fund, nothing comes up. So we are making this up as we go. This process is always evolving and we need something that we can quickly edit and turn around and say, oh, we want to change how we're doing this. I need to see it in the grading workflow in two hours. So the answer to that was widgets. IPy widgets, um, also known as just plain old widgets, are the interactive arm of the Jupyter project. They used to be a part of the IPython project that you would import them under the IPython module. They've be since been separated out into their own, uh, their own repo. And they play really nicely with the Jupyter, uh, current Jupyter um, environment. But so far they've largely been focused on digesting data. Um, when, what I mean by that is, you throw a widget in your notebook and it allows you to change the axes on a graph or choose what data is being plot, um, plotted. Uh, it's awesome, it brings users closer to their data. But I thought, why not take this a step further and actually build a fully blown application, something that we can use every day to do our jobs with widgets. And so that is what I did. But first a little bit on how they work, and I apologize um, that I am kind of doing some hand waving here. Widgets are Awesome, the whole Jupyter project is very complex and takes care of all this crazy stuff in the background for you. Um, it's like totally awesome. If you're interested, you should go and dig into the source code. It's all on GitHub, all open source. But widgets, uh, at their essence, use this thing called the comms API, short for communications, to synchronize a Python model in the back end, and that back end could be a server in the cloud or it could be your local machine, with a JavaScript view, what's being viewed in your browser. They handle all sorts of WebSocket complexity for us, asynchronous calls, they run really fast. Um, so just take that and say, wow, widgets are great. Thank you for doing all the stuff for me, widgets. First, some basics. There's two basic components that made up my uh, migrating workflow. The first was forms. Forms are some sort of uh, input device. They can, be, they can come in many forms, uh, integer, this here we have an integer field, a drop down menu, an area to enter comments, um, and you can access the value of a widget by calling for certain attributes on, on, the, on that widget object. Um, so this is very object oriented, it'll make sense to you if you spend any time dealing with Python, super easy to implement. And best of all, if you're like me and you don't know anything really about front end development, all that front end is just magically taken care of for you. So all you're dealing with is Python. And it's in the same environment that you've already been doing all your data science. And the next important component are buttons. Buttons, unlike forms, are stateless, meaning that they're not automatically synchronized with the Python model in the back end. So in order to make them stateful, we have to set an onClick function. Um, and you do that very similarly to how you'd set an onClick in JavaScript. And this makes the, the button stateful in that it sets a listener, it says, when I'm clicked in this front end, send a com to the back end and execute this function. 
And so quickly you can start to string together widgets and build um, and build out your form that you're going to make that you're going to use for your application. Uh, a really handy tool that comes with the widgets project are H boxes and V boxes, horizontal boxes and vertical boxes. Um, you can use these to put together widgets in a way that looks like a real form you'd see on a website. Um, if you just start displaying them, they'll just appear in order and it looks a little bit messy. I should note that the display function, which comes with IPython, is what renders the JavaScript view in the front end. So you need to call that to say, set up this, uh, this JavaScript view so that, um, so that our user can interact with it. And that also takes care of a bunch of the synchronization, uh, synchronization complexity behind the scenes. You can also um, edit uh, certain features of widgets using the, those same attributes that you were using to call for the value of the widgets before. So stuff like the margin, font size, you all recognize this from, uh, from your basic knowledge of CSS. And once you have that, you can then, so now we have our input We've got our form, and now we have to think about how do we digest data. So a really useful tool um, that I'm a huge fan of is QGrid. It's something that one of our developers at Quantovian, Scott Sanderson, who's actually also speaking here tomorrow, um, developed. And it's a tool for, uh, you, for digesting large amounts of data frame in a notebook in a really fast way. And so it's based on the SlickGrid uh, Slick JS um, JavaScript grid view and runs, uh, runs in Python, so you can just pass it something like, a, or you pass it a data frame, um, and it'll render it as a sortable, filterable grid. It's really cool because it is aware of the types of columns, so if you have a date column, it can be filtered like it's a date column, and in, similarly with an integer column, filtered like an integer, or a text column, filtered with searching on text. So this is particularly useful for us uh, as we're looking at grading algorithms, and we want to say, okay, we've done all this grading, now, end of the month, what are our A's? So I want to see my A's, and I want to see the most recent ones, and QGrid allows us to do that in a really slick, slick way. So now combining QGrid with our form, we've got this awesome beginnings of an actual application. This is more than just choosing what we're going to plot. This is, we are going to use this every day to process data um, and store it in a database. But if you're like me, that isn't quite enough. You want to know a little bit more how the widgets work and see if we can become like a little bit more of a power user. And so I'm going to talk about two custom, uh, custom wid widget modifications. Um, as examples of how you pass things back and forth between the front and back end. The first is that we're going to make it so that when we select a row in QGrid, it's going to pass the algo ID of that row to our form. So instead of having to copy paste that algo ID, we're going to click the row and it's automatically going to appear in our form. And the second is that when we submit a new grade, instead of having to reload uh, the data from our database in QGrid to, to get that grade populated in the table, we're going to submit the grade to the database, but also pass that grade directly to the view so it can just update it right away in, in the QGrid. So first, let's talk about the front to back. This is JavaScript. It's not as pretty as Python code, but you'll have to, do, you'll have to deal with it. I apologize too, a lot, of this is, uh, a lot of this is omitted just for the sake of getting this all on one slide. Um, and so, here we're defining a QGrid, a QGrid view and we're extending upon the DOM widgets view base class. And this is awesome because the DOM widgets view base class comes with all these handy functions that allow us to do things like pass data back and forth between the front and back end in IPython. And so here we are, um, we're setting a listener on mouse down, which is a, which is a function that comes with SlickGrid and saying, okay, if SlickGrid is clicked, now we want to execute this function that's going to take the selected row, pull out the data, put it in a message, and send that message to the, to the back end. And so that, that little send uh, method comes with the DOM widgets view um, base class and makes it really easy to do, uh, to do that kind of um, communication. You'll also notice here, um, that there's stuff that looks like this dot 
dollar sign L, which that is a also another really handy built-in feature that allows you to like quickly access the um, jQuery uh, object that is the QGrid container, um, and as well as stuff like this.model.get, which allows us to pull attributes directly from the Python model into the JavaScript view. And so once we've sent our message away, it flies through space to the Python model, where it's received by a custom listener that we set up within our Python QGrid widget class. And you'll notice again that here, this, this QGrid widget class inherits from the widgets DOM widgets base class. Um, that's also, again, really important in that it uh, inherits all these really helpful, or really helpful methods and attributes that um, allow it to sync with the JavaScript view. Importantly, this view module and view name are required fields when you're building a custom widget. Um, here we're telling, we're telling the Python um, backend, this is where you should look for our front end, and also this is the name of our front end so that they can get, they can get in sync. This little sync equals true um, is part of the traitlets library. Uh, and traitlets are type safe uh, attributes that you can add to modules. They're particularly useful in widgets um, for some, for, because they, they take this sync argument and that, a lot, that says when this attribute changes, send it to the, uh, to the view, make it available to the view when something changes. So here, we're, we're setting up this custom listener, handle QGrid message, receiving our message. If it's of the type we expect, then pull out the row data, pull out the algo ID from the row data, and set it to that selected ID traitlet, which we'll be able to access from a variety of places. And so now, when we click in our QGrid, that traitlet, uh, the, the value of the algo ID becomes available in the, in the Python model. It's set to, the, to set to the value of that selected ID traitlet. And we're using this link function, which comes with traitlets, to link the value of that selected ID to the value of this field here, of the algo ID field. And so this can be used for a number of things. There's a lot of really cool applications um, where you, that involve linking together widgets. Highly recommend going and checking out some of the examples in the IPy widgets uh, GitHub repo. And so now that we've done that, we're comfortable syncing things from front to back. Let's talk a little bit about syncing things from back to front. And so, if you remember, our second goal was to, as we su submit a new grade, make it so that that grade will be not only put in the database, but, but automatically populated in our front end. And to do that, we've, I'm writing this uh, custom function inside of our QGrid widgets uh, model. And this, if you're gonna be writing good reusable code, you would probably write something a little bit more generalizable that would you know, take, a, take indexes rather than taking graders and grades. Um, but for the purpose of this demonstration and this custom widget, we've written something that takes care of everything for us. So we pass it an algo ID, a grader, and a grade. It'll find, it'll look in the uh, data frame that's associated with the QGrid, find the row and column indices, and then pass those indices along with the grade and a label for this message to the front end. And so then this flies to the front end where it is received by a custom message handler that we are defining. Um, This.mol.on is how you define a custom message or a custom handler in a, in, in a widget. And this message colon custom is backbone JS syntax and it's saying, if a message of this type custom is received, then send it to this handle message function. So once we receive this custom message, it goes to our handle message function where it's processed, we confirm it's of the type we're expecting, and we're using slick grid, which as you remember, QGrid is an extension upon the uh, JavaScript project slick grid to get the cell node. So this is the cell node in this case is going to return a jQuery object that points to, this is the exact um, bit on our table that we're gonna wanna update. So we pull out that jQuery object, set the inner text to our new value, and we're in business. But before that can work, 
we need to know who our user is, right? Like I said before, I don't want people just typing in their name that's prone to errors. Um, the, the more we can abstract away from the user and just let them do their job, the better. And so we're going to use this handy little feature of the IPython uh, project that allows you to access um, bash commands directly from the notebook. So those of you familiar with IPython will know that you can write bang and then a bash command and it'll execute that command as if it's a terminal command and send you back the response. So in this function get user, we're going to use that functionality to pull from our JupyterHub server who the logged in user is. And we're going to do that by first defining uh, a dictionary of usernames of bash or of our Jupyter Hub usernames mapped to usernames in the context of the grading notebook, and then calling bang echo and then the global variable user. And the response should be who is the user of this of, of the current session of this uh, Jupyter Hub um, server. And so we get our response, pull it in, uh, pass it to this dictionary, and get out the user in the context of our grading notebook. And then within our new grade function, we can use that to get our, get our user, as well as accessing the uh, selected grade and algo ID from the fields in our form, write those to the database if everything goes all right, then update the grade in QGrid using that custom function we just defined, um, and we should be good to go. We just have to set it to be uh, the onclick function of that um, grade button that's already a part of that uh, nested form. Another really cool trick that you can use to make your applications look professional is um, hiding the code cells. I think this should be a default feature in the IPython project. So if any of you are IPython Jupyter dev devs out there, like this is a feature request. But um, you can really easily add this yourselves. And by just creating a button widget that will execute some JavaScript that just hides the cells, hides the inputs. And so by clicking this guy, you can get rid of all your code cells, um, which will just leave you with your widgets or whatever displays or queue grids you have on the page. And it just looks like a uh, looks like an ordinary ordinary application page. Another really cool uh, display gem that has helped me a lot in creating more professional looking applications right on this uh, IPython environment is to change the width of the code cells um, by making them wider. This is especially helpful when you're working with QGrid because it allows you to render your columns a little bit wider so you can more easily see what's going on in your data. Um, so that's another cool trick. And here again, we're using uh, the display function that comes with IPython, as well as the HTML function, which just allows you to execute arbitrary HTML um, in the notebook. And we're just passing in this style tag saying, set the width of the, of the code container to be 90% of, uh, of the screen. And so now we have our final application with our updating value and we can set the grades straight from straight into the view. Um, and I've uploaded this notebook to GitHub. Um, if you're interested in, oh, got a little cut off there, but if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff, check that out. There's also a ton of resources on the IPython, uh, IPython um, repo as well as the IPy widgets repo. So yeah, thank you. Yeah? So how do you come up with a way to maybe partially run the code that will initialize this so that when somebody clicks, you just open up this window that would have literally this, but pre run so that it actually has an output? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I haven't written anything that will automatically execute a notebook when it opens. I think sometimes that's considered to be kind of a no-no in like development to just arbitrarily run code so as soon as someone loads a page but the run all cells um, button within ipython you can go in the top uh, nav bar and click run all cells and then hopefully that would just set everything up for your user and you can also have it execute that hide code cells um, function so that when they do run all the cells it hides everything and makes it look pretty clean i can show you what one of the 
editions of what we're working with looks right now. Look right now. So this is a fun grading notebook um, that I developed. And here, these are all fields where um, where you can enter filters, so you can query out uh, algorithms by different performance metrics. Um, and in this notebook, I just have it configured so that when someone runs all the cells, it automatically hides the code cells and gives you uh, and gives you a nice clean output. It's also nice that we can integrate this directly with PyFolio. Um, there's no need for the for the grader to bounce back and forth between different notebooks. Um, that's another beauty of of doing everything right from your Jupyter Hub environment is that just bring all your tools in one place. No reason to write a custom Flask app that has to pull in from all these different sources. It's already all there. Yeah. Cool. Thank you guys. <laughs>